Masculinity is under attack on two fronts. The first attack comes from feminism. Radical feminism promotes the idea that traditional manhood is not only toxic, but also hurtful to women and hurtful to 52 imagined genders. Oh wait, it's 74 now. The second line of attack comes from Hollywood, which promotes a twisted concept of manhood that is base, vulgar, and immoral. Fair warning, if you're a radical feminist, I suggest you click away immediately because this video dismantles the lies of toxic feminism and discovers the virtues of real manhood. As we get started, please hit the like button to help us spread the truth. Now let's tackle our first point. Number one, the patriarchy is not toxic. Our body, our choice! Our body, our choice! Our body, our Pro-abortion rallies frequently feature signs that attack the patriarchy. Has got to go, hey, hey! Ho, ho! The patriarchy has got to go, hey, hey! Ho, ho! The patriarchy has got to go! What is the patriarchy? And why do leftists hate it so much? The word patriarchy comes from pater, which means father in Latin. Patriarchy is a natural consequence of the traditional family. The social unit of the family calls for an authority that will keep it united. This authority is usually the patriarch, who has the gift to discern, lead, harmonize, coordinate, set the tone, and bring out the best in others. The patriarch is what sociologists call a representative character. He inspires his family members to seek goals of perfection. When imbued with Catholic virtue, he moves his family to the highest of all goals, sanctification. Far from being toxic, the patriarchy is necessary for the growth, development, and progress of society. A healthy society is structured around good fathers. You know what's toxic? liberals who want to destroy the natural leadership and influence of good fathers. Number two, boys are not toxic. First day of school, third grade, my younger brother and I were playing at recess. We were playing soldiers with guns, with guns like that, with the fingers going bang, bang. And then the yard duty showed up with an army of little children in front of her, and she was saying she was afraid for her life conveniently placing the children in front of her. But we were taken and sent to the principal's office. We had no clue what we did wrong. We were completely confused, my younger brother and I. And then my father was called and told that he needed to come in because his sons, us, were demonstrating very violent and antisocial behavior. So he comes in and it was the principal and the school psychologist there and my father turned to, to the school psychologist and asked Randy when you were a boy didn't you play cowboys and Indians wasn't that normal back in the day and all he did was blush and look away from my father because apparently it was fine then and boys can't be boys anymore American scientist Dr. Luan Brizendine author of the books The Male Brain and the Female Brain explains what feminists hate to accept Boys and girls develop differently, think differently, and communicate differently. However, our education system favors girls over boys. As psychologist and New York Times best-selling author Michael Thompson states, girls' behavior is the gold standard in schools. Boys are treated like defective girls. Now that sounds like toxic feminism, doesn't it? Number three, violence against evil is not toxic. Every day, evildoers disturb the peace. Acts of violence like home invasions, school shooters, or terrorist attacks need to be addressed with physical force. For that reason, some professions require the use of physical force like the United States Marine Corps and the police. The use of force against violent criminals is good and just. It's also necessary for the maintenance of order and peace. And it's normal for men to be attracted to these honorable jobs. Civis pacem, para bellum. The Latin maxim, if you want peace, prepare for war, is not outdated. 
And since men are the best warriors, they are the best peacemakers as well. You know it is toxic, though, when liberals attack the police or dishonor the military profession, pretending that nice words alone will stop a school shooter. Number four, real men practice purity. Hollywood projects a false image of manhood. Its movies feature profane, impure, and immoral men. But real men are virtuous and pure. True manhood is united so closely to virtue that the word for man in Latin is vir. Vir and virtue have the same root. In contrast, Hollywood presents men who indulge in every disorderly passion, men who become enslaved to sin. But nothing strips manliness away from men more than this enslavement to sin. A man who governs his passions is master of his world, teaches St. Dominic. We must either command them or be enslaved by them. It is better to be a hammer than an anvil. Professor Plinio Correa de Oliveira states, there is no other virtue that prepares one more for manliness than purity. Men who have the strength to fight impurity are capable of every type of heroism. Therefore, the apex of masculinity is sanctity. A man's man is a saint. Number five, scholarly men are not toxic. There is nothing wrong with being a man of thought. In fact, the best men of action are frequently men of profound thought. Plato got it right when he said, a man should strive to have a balance between his physical and mental development. Throughout history, men perfected their intellect in philosophy, politics, engineering, theology, history, and even science. Grand intellectual pursuits gave men the ability to tackle and solve complex problems. It's not a question of how many degrees you have. It's about using your intelligence properly. Consider the army general, who orchestrates hundreds of complex battle maneuvers in his mind. Or think about the colossal intellectual achievements of St. Thomas Aquinas. There's nothing toxic about gifted generals or brilliant theologians. Number six, civilized men are not toxic. Good manners, etiquette, and courtesy are noble traits that every man should acquire and practice. Even poor men are able to practice these virtues. Before feminism, men were gentlemen. Always striving for a higher standard of excellence, the gentleman willingly overcame the brutal part of his nature and displayed masculine gentleness that spoke of dignity, nobility, and protection. It was the Catholic Church that first recognized and elevated the dignity of men, but especially women who were so degraded in pagan times. Christian morality created an atmosphere of charity, trust, and respect that harmonized and protected both sexes. It's not toxic to be a gentleman. But you know what is toxic? Reverting back to barbaric times when women were treated like cattle. Number seven, it's not toxic to be adventurous. Every man loves adventure. It's the driving force behind boyhood battles, exploration, and daring dreams. Missionaries, pioneers, explorers, captains and sailors who charted the world's seas endured great risk, sacrifice, and suffering to achieve epic goals. From St. Isaac Jogues, who braved every hardship to convert the Indians, to men like Lewis and Clark, who trailblazed 8,000 miles across America, there is a constant search for something beyond the domestic, parochial, and provincial. This yearning for greatness is good, not toxic. Number eight, male breadwinners are not toxic. Feminists argue that women should equally be the breadwinners of the family. To make the point, they compete with men in the workforce, often at the expense of motherhood. As a result, children are treated as time-consuming burdens that need to be sent off to daycare where they miss their mother's care and affection. Although circumstances might force both mother and father to work, it is not ideal. There is nothing wrong for men to be the sole breadwinners of the family. There is nothing wrong with having fewer material things in life, especially if mothers can focus more on rearing children. What's toxic? When children are raised by strangers in daycare centers. Number nine, chivalry is not toxic. The more feminism attempts to tear down chivalry, 
the more it shines. The virtues of Catholic chivalry that flourished in the Middle Ages did more to perfect manhood than anything else in history. Even today, crusaders like St. Louis IX or St. Ferdinand of Castile continue to set the standard of what it means to be a man. Father Robert Kane writes that during the Middle Ages, there was a light which grew brighter as the gloom around grew blacker. A light that had been kindled within men's souls by a fire that came from heaven, the light of honor that was fanned by divine faith till it reached the glorious radiance of Christian chivalry. Father Cain continues, Without chivalry, wealth has no worth, pleasure no charm, fame no fascination, success no crown. Without it, prosperity crumbles to the value of the dust, and all the finer flowers of human life wither beneath the breath of bitter but just contempt. Life without chivalry leaves a gaping void in our soul, and no amount of modern entertainment, sports, or video games can fill that emptiness and lack of purpose. Number 10. What is God calling you to be? There's no cookie-cutter way to be a man. Every man should strive to practice as many virtues as possible. But since every soul is different, each man should pray for the grace to understand God's specific calling for him. Like so many Crusader saints, we should ask the Virgin Mary to guide us on the path to sainthood. Pray for courage, never give up, and always seek heroic perfection. Please like this video and post a comment. God bless you.